My name is Dominic Williams, I'm from Wales. Uh, my opening was in Welsh, but the rest of this evening's proceedings are going to be conducted in the English language, uh, except from maybe some poetry. I'm the curator of the Dublin Thomas International Literature Residency, which is taking place this year in the centenary year of Dylan Thomas's birth here in Tronos. Dylan Thomas is probably the most famous Welsh language writer in the English language throughout the world. So in his honour, we have collected international writers from around the world for this, this residency. And as part of the residency, we have a fringe festival which has public facing events, the chances for for you to engage with the writers and with their writing. So I'm going to introduce three of the writers who are here this evening on the residency. Ben Dobby Auckland is, is, a, is a polymath. He's a, he's a musician, a journalist, a poet, uh, an artist, a painter. And Ben's artistic journey started in 1968 when he was arrested and thrown into prison in Istanbul. And that started a, a journey for him, an engagement with other artists that was really, really intense for the next, for the next decade, for the rest of his life, really. Um, uh, Bengt has produced prolifically. He's currently working as a journalist for the only Roma magazine in Sweden. And he has published two volumes of his autobiography, both in the format of collections of poetry. Nasli Holgera, uh, comes from the same hometown as the great Dylan Thomas. Maybe I should say the great Natalie Holborough. Um, <laughs> Natalie is, is a Welsh poet and, and a writer. And she, in 2013, was the runner-up to the Terry Hellerton Award for, for writing, and is currently a versifier in Five Cum Donkin Drive. Five Cum Donkin Drive is the house where Dylan Thomas was born in Swansea and is now a living museum to his legacy. And at some point, I'm sure this evening, uh, Natalie will explain to us what a versifier is. Uh, Anasir Rachman is originally from, from Bangladesh, uh, a poet and a playwright who has been living in Uppsala for five, four years. Four years. In, in 2013, uh, Anasir was awarded the Prince Wilhelm Award by Swedish Pen and is currently writing a play. His first book in Bengali, his first collection of poetry, was The Empty Glass in 2003, and he's recently published a collection of poetry in Swedish called The Six Seasons. And finally, um, from Tranas, the man from the home, is uh, Peter Nyberg, who is uh, an inspiration and at the centre, a cultural hub for, uh, for literature in Tranas. He's the editor of Popular Poesy, the online and hard copy magazine. And he's going to be our host for this evening. And I'm going to let Peter join you in experiencing some of the work of these writers and some of their inspirations. Peter. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, first of all, I'm interested in how you started to write. You're looking at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as uh, Dominic so will like to explain, I started writing in jail in Turkey. Uh, I uh, landed in jail in Turkey with a heavy psychosis. I was literally taken care of by an Italian artist and uh, poet. And in that environment, there were a lot of people not a lot, but there were like six, seven people coming and going. Uh, had gone to university. They had. They were poets. They were musicians, uh, painters, sculptors, and I uh, was very inspired by by this new environment for me. And I started to write because, at the same time, I also started to play the guitar, and I was trying to make songs for the first time. So I started to write English song lyrics, and yeah, that's how it started. Yeah. Um, 
to begin writing there are two contexts. One is the, the, when you are not feeling good, and one is when you are falling in love. But in my case, uh, it happened, uh, it was a very hard time in Bangladesh, 1989, uh, in the March. In Bengali, we have a Bengali calendar, Bengali month, it's called Chaitra. It's a, it's a cultivating period for Bangladesh. Then, uh, by, we have a um, uh, agricultural tradition for major income uh, used to come from agriculture. And we, the time is uh, when it's cultivating time, then you need to buy fertilizer, you need to fix labor, and irrigation, everything. It's a very economic hard time. Then I came from this school, and it's in the afternoon then. And it is a kind of depression in the family and pressure in every sense and practicalities. Then I did not feel good. Then I was feeling this, what can I do? Then I sit on my desk and I took pen and paper. Then I wrote something that it, and then I read it, became a poem. Then I sent it to the school magazine. It's called Jagaran in Bengali. The, in English can be the emergence or something else. Then they published it. Then later on, I became the editor of the magazine. That was the beginning of writing. Um, I started writing in school. It's something I've always remembered doing. Um, I've always been an avid reader, but I guess I didn't really enjoy school that much, so writing would be something that kept me grounded, uh, something I could enjoy. Um, I suppose it was mostly stories, but then as I reached GCSE year, I was a bit unsure of poetry. I always thought it was rhyming, it was Wordsworth, Shakespeare sonnets. Um, was introduced to Seamus Heaney's midterm break and thought, actually, this is really powerful stuff. So I got onto Dylan Thomas, Sylvia Plath, um, and decided, actually, I'd really like to express myself this way, so I've kept up writing fiction, doing art, but poetry has become my biggest passion, really. All three of you as poetry, as you general uh, way of writing. Uh, why? I think it just expresses, it's a way to express yourself in ways perhaps that fiction can't always. Sometimes it's really hard to find the words, find a concrete sort of way to explain something. With poetry it's more fluid, um, images can suggest things, people can take what they want from it, and no two people are going to look at a poem and have the same perception <coughs> or give the same feedback on it. It means something different, something unique and personal to anyone who's going to read it. That's what I, like. I have written short stories, drama. None, none of it's published, but poetry has been the way my writing has always returned to. Uh, why? I have no clue. <laughs> I think, uh, I guess it's, uh, it's, it's closest to me to write poetry. It's, uh, I just love the way, in, in the short format, I think over the years I, I, I've learned how to scale down the word, scale down the, the, the expression to really get the really exactness of expression, which is really my, my aim with my poetry. Um, the poetry is a kind of feeling and uh, and it's also the highest form of ex exposing the truth that in our, and you, need, you can deal with the very indirect way then you can tell the truth exactly you want to feel but in other forms it does not function that's why but we i do other things in support of myself to continue in poetry but my inner sense does not uh, is not biased to other writing If you, uh, the purpose with writing when you started, if you consider it against the purpose now, well, is there any different? And how is it different? If my purpose, I don't know if I had a purpose at the beginning, uh, it was just a, a desire to, do, I, I wanted to, to write songs. I was. Uh, learning to play Dylan songs on the guitar and remembering all the lyrics and I want to write, write my own songs. And uh, at the same time I was also reading my big 
literary heroes at the time were Dylan Thomas, William Blake, and Rabindranath Tagore. And I was really, I, I, I was actually wanting to be able to write the way they did. So I, at that time, I wrote a lot of poetry in the style of these three people. And uh, today, uh, I, I still have remnants of these people in my writing, uh, especially Dylan Thomas. His way of making the musicality of his poetry is something that I still live with. Um, I guess I started just wanting to express myself. I found it really hard in school to just go out there, be myself, be loud, be boisterous. That was a way I could channel that energy. But I loved the way reading poetry as well. You could get a sense of who's, who's written it, what they must have been going through. Um, sort of way their mind works. And I don't think that's really changed. That's something that still fascinates me. I'm fascinated by human emotions, uh, reactions to things, and just how we're all affected by different things in different ways. So it hasn't really changed. Uh, for writing poetry and for first usual, uh, there is no particular for first. It's a kind of situation, it's a mental situation, it's a, it's a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings in you. And you have an extreme size, you cannot control, you, you cannot stop you to uh, express it. There's a situation. And the situation from the beginning to the end, it doesn't change truly. But uh, you do some other things in support of this mental situation in you, in, in support of your, making your feeling. And I should also uh, supplement one thing, that is, in general sense, every writing is a kind of poetry. Oh, you all talk about poetry as it is a, a part of yourself. Um, how, how close the things you write, how autobiographical is that? As a, to be a poet is like uh, to open a hotel, and a hotel means it's 24, it will open 24 hours. Then one day you will get, uh, the, all rooms are full with guests, the other day is no guests. Mm -hmm. But you cannot close the door, you must open the hotel. And this is a mental situation, and, is a, and this is a pain or, uh, for a poet to continue. And it's like to be a poet, to invite the devil in you when you are fighting with the devil all the time. It's not a happy life. Mm. Um, I've heard a lot of people say um, that there's always a part of yourself in writing and I've looked at some of my work and thought no there's nothing that's fictional perhaps I've used Greek heroes or um, characters from literature and I thought that's not really me but then when you look deeper into things I think there is parts of yourself there are things mental things going on that slip through into your writing so I don't think you can take any piece of work as purely fictional, there must be some part of the writer in there. I mean, this, people will still debate it, discuss it, but I don't think there's any definite answer for it. I totally agree with you. There's, there's nothing fictitious about my writing either. Uh, I'd rather put it like it's, for me, it's kind of a mania. It's a, it's a, it's a need. I mean, I, I, I'm constantly have to find some way to express how reality works. And uh, it's, it's been my quest for the past 40 years, I think, to, to, to try to understand for myself, and perhaps to explain to others, I hope, uh, what is the meaning of existence? What is the meaning of reality? What is the meaning of living? Why are we here? What the fuck is happening? That's probably the basics of my poetry. If you, who are more established poets, would give a young man or woman an advice, uh, what would it be? If you, he or she wanted to start writing? Hey, well, yeah. keep on writing and write and write and write because through writing you get the experience and you get to find your own voice and you want your own expression. I think there's, there's no uh, easy ways of getting to be a good poet. You have to work. Um, I, I don't really consider myself an experienced writer or someone in a, a, you know, a position to give, tell people what to do with writing. I'm very much still learning 
and uh, meeting people who are influence, influencing me and helping me along the way. But um, one piece of advice that I've been given and I've always stuck with and found helpful is to keep reading as well. Um, yes. I, I agree yes. with Ben yeah. as well that you should write, but unless you read, you're not picking up on other people's styles and finding new ways of challenging yourself mm. and being able to express yourself. Um, it's not. Uh, it's a kind of stupidity as uh, being uh, someone to try to write and also give an advice. It's not a good uh, situation. But uh, what can I do? That what I learned that I can share. Then, if someone likes, it. As, uh, I have a friend you know, uh, in Osaka. He's also president of Swedish Pen, Ulla Dashmal. So I learned from him is that never stop writing, never stop reading, and also you, you must not have an excuse. You don't have time then you must have time. This is one thing. And second thing is, is to, to be honest to yourself, to, 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 to fight for the truth uh, at your last. So this is the basic thing uh, that can help you to survive in writing. We should hear Natalie's poem now. OK. Um. My first one is the one I submitted this year for Terry Hetherington. Um, I was lucky enough to work with this one on um, on my course actually with the poet um, Nigel Jenkins, who was a very popular uh, poet from Gower and passed away in January. So this, I think, is a little tribute to him from his help. This one's called Jack Does. In the last days of his life, he lay there all day tipped on his side, unmoving, one eye cracked open, watching squirrels streak the windows like meteorites. I propped him up as he sucked and wheezed, phlegm smack in his throat, such slippery gold, he spat in a paper cup, though his last smoke was a Cuban on his 50th birthday. I waited for the next breath. Crushed like a nettle, this bulk of a man who'd fought in wars, shouldered a gun, ducked and dropped in the trenches, looked at me with drowsy eyes, tube wriggling of one black nostril, slack-jawed, dribbling with drugs. I buried a kiss on the side of his head, felt his slow pulse on my mouth. The breath sputtered out like a blossom. Pulling the sheet to his chin, the nurse, being kind, touched my arm softly, gave me a minute to gather myself and carry my silence outside, where jackdaws tugged worms from the hospital lawn, unpeeling themselves from the world. Uh, there are many ways to face a public. Uh, Internet is one. You, you can put your things out on the internet. In the internet, uh, slams are another way to face your public. Uh, how do you do your writing in, in spite of that? In, in, do you think about how you will perform your poetry? Or is that all a matter when you write? Um, I think that I'm quite lucky in Swansea that we've got such a thriving open mic spoken word scene yeah. and before I started going to that I was very much head down, write it, post it online and hide behind the screen. But I think if you challenge yourself you step up and you share your work, you start to meet people, um, someone might be interested in your work and you can learn from other people, um, find out about other events and I think you have to attend them, you have to get your work out there if you want to be listened to as well. Uh, for a poet, it is uh, luck. There is three luck. One luck is to find uh, inspire, uh, a source of inspiration, a reader. So if you can find uh, one reader in your life, then you, you don't need to find thousands. And the second, uh, uh, the second and third luck are to find a good editor and also a translator. Then, after all this, you need to continue and you need to survive in writing. The other things are just, you will give you the networking and the publishing channels. These are necessary. They should not be undermined. But in the beginning, one can do many things. 
but at one stage one has to have a strategy publishing strategy and to come in the main publishing and main magazine and all the things that's all. well to me it's <coughs> to quote Dylan Thomas poetry to, to, to find out if your poem is working or not it's like letting the cat out of the bag I mean your poem if you cannot read it something is wrong with it and having said that I think I'm not a slam poet I never have been a slam poet but a slam poet is a performer but I am a performer in the way that I can read my poetry on stage and with confidence because there is some musicality in it that I can trust and uh, comparing that to publishing it online uh, there's no big difference because you meet an audience with a silent audience but I think the musicality of my writing is, is the most important part of it because if you, I think if it's, uh, your poetry is not musical people have a hard time reading it uh, and it's not that enjoyment that I, I want my poetry to be enjoyable in, in a musical sense uh, so I work really hard with, the, with, with, with the, the construction of the poem to make it as as uh, musical as possible with in rhymes, with rhymes, but never in, in, in a certain format. But there, there's always this musical element in my poetry. And, uh, and I don't see a difference between reading it on stage, reading it on the page, or reading it online. But there is a difference with slam poetry, so I cannot perform slam poetry. Yes. When you, uh, there are a lot of people who put out the poems on uh, internet, yes. uh, and they get criticism on the on the poems and rewrite them, and it's kind of a school. Have you tried that? Um, I do keep a blog online. Um, it's mostly positive stuff. The criticism can be hard to take sometimes if you're quite sensitive. I'm very oversensitive a lot of the time. But it does as well. You, I've learned as well on my course that criticism can be really helpful if it's constructive. And I respect that people will share and will tell you because if you don't receive that criticism, if you don't offer your work for people to look at, then how are you going to grow and develop? You can't, as a writer, notice everything that you're perhaps making mistakes with or um, little errors that you're overlooking. It's, it takes another person to go and look and say, okay, this is something you keep doing. Perhaps you want to look at that, want to change it. Uh, it is good to have the feedback, but uh, uh, poetry is never guided by others, no critics, no nothing. Only good thing is that your source of inspiration will think you are the best poet in his life or in her life or in their life. Or that there's the, uh, there's the blessing if you can have this luck. And, uh, and for criticism from the literary magazine or editors or scholars, a poet does not truly care. And when you are making your, making your spontaneity in words, then you forget everything. It's a very solitary business, and it's a very uh, secret work, and you are very private, and it's, you just forget everything. If you cannot forget, then you cannot make poetry. Then nothing works there. You are very alone in that world, and you are the king, and you are everything in this. Uh, secret moment, and is it like uh, if you look at uh, an animal who is uh, uh, giving birth of uh, their child, even mother, uh, then you you can imagine the uh, moment. Then to create a poetry, you have to make what is like almost the same. Well, uh, I've been uh, online with my poetry since ninety seven, ninety eight, I think. In the beginning, the constructive criticism was important. Today, I don't get any. Uh, but I can, I, I notice, and I, I, I'm guided by the amounts of people that like a certain po poem. That okay, so this is the thing that's it's working. But at the same time, I, 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 I cannot consider that when I when I do when I write a new poem, of course, because I write what I think is the best I can do. I. I'd like to supplement it a bit. And it's also important in making your time. That if you are occupied by many things, then ho ho what is your time for reading and writing? And uh, 
if I do the blog and all other things and I take the FD correspondence, then I don't have time to do these things. It's better I can use my time to send my text to the magazines or to take contact with the publisher or these things is, I think, good. I, I did, I've sent a lot of manuscripts to, to newspapers and publishers. I have a, a pile of <laughs> these like uh, refusals. So I've given up on that department. Uh, well, I can share one thing. You know, the two giants in Scandinavia, Steenberg and Ibsen, both were poets and playwrights. And Steenberg had a strategy. He has a never ended, never ending effort, a never ending trial. So he sent a manuscript to Boniash. Boniash said, you know, that another manuscript is on post. Then he's taking contract with the theater and he he was waiting for the uh, answer. Then he's sending another one. He was like this. And he never read his manuscript second time. Just he used to write and just threw on the floor. But if you compare to Ibsen, he, it was a routine for Ibsen to write a text three times. So he has to have, he had to have have a three and third time version for every uh, piece of writing. So it's a kind of individual style, what we do, finally. Uh, you, who are online, do, do you give a critic to other poets? I, I did more before, actually. I, I'm pretty bad at doing it these days, uh, because I don't have I, I have, I'm a family man, I have a wife, I have my work, and, and then the, the few hours I have left of the day where I can actually write something and publish it on the internet. And I, I, do, I do try to, to read other people's stuff and give a, a comment or at least press the like button. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, I, I do try, but it's, it's uh, no, not so much. Um. I think it's important if you want feedback, critical feedback, to give critical feedback as well. But I'd never go out there and decide oh, I'm going to say this for the sake of it to insult someone. I would always give that criticism um, in a way that's positive. Um, just say, oh, perhaps you might like to change this or um, try something different here. But I think if the writing needs changing, then I mean, give them advice, give them pointers. Don't just say why. Don't just say you don't like it and don't say why. I think it's important to explain as well. Let me add, uh, before a few years ago, I, I actually did go, go in, go in, commented on various people's poetry. And I said, no, you shouldn't write like this. You should write like that. You shouldn't do like this. You should do like that. And it, it didn't turn out very well. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, as in, if I'm not asked, I, I usually about to comment on poetry. And if something is I should appreciate, so I don't do it. I just immediately appreciate and uh, try to inspire. And as a, to be a poet, uh, to, uh, writing is a never ending process. It's a continuous. So it's good to give the uh, inspiration, not to give the frustration. Then if you give a frustration to a writer, then you are killing a writer. So one should not do these things. And so and I myself also be careful to sh share my things. If, if I am not sure the, what can be the feedback, as I don't care the feedback, I know, but I know the, uh, what could be the inspiration. And but I that, think that there is criticism that it's not frustrated. Uh, it's, uh, there is feedback and criticism, and criticism you know, the newspaper and magazines, it can be a long discussion. There is uh, ups and downs and uh, neutrality, objectivity and subjectivity, many things. And also they put comment also. And the comment from the when uh, your own manuscript is refused from the publishers and then you can read the very, sometimes very, uh, you don't need to get this in manuscripts. But, but it, there is a kind of revolution on the internet these days. There's a lot of people writing poetry on the internet. And the thing is, a lot of it is really bad. And I mean, if, if I was going to be the, the criticizer of all of that, I mean, I, that would be a lifetime work. That's a new style to make your time. I think it's important to develop, though. I mean, if you haven't got that feedback, you're stuck writing in the same way all the time. I think it's important if you're giving it not to kill the writer's voice, not to change it completely, saying, you shouldn't write like this. Mm. You've got oh, to keep that voice there, but to perhaps say, or oh, perhaps you might like to try this as well, just to improve 
Uh, as a, I run some writing groups, as I know how to do it. As a, in our group, when if you ask for an open feedback, and next time the, the participant will not come, and when I feel that I should tell something that can help him to continue in writing, then I suggest to set a meeting with coffee. Then I, then I suggest to read them. I don't directly say that this is the limitation, this is the problem. I just say, uh, read them and then read your own things. Then you will find where is the limitation. Then you will find yourself. As a, to be a poet is a self-educating process, a self-educating thing. Even if I tell this, do this and do this, but they will not uh, do it. As it's a very, to be a poet is a, to be a dictator. A, uh, they don't care any dictation. I know the feeling. I just uh, give some, uh, um, I share my ideas. You can read him, you can read this book. Mm -hmm. Then you'll, then read your text again. Then you'll get the problem, where is the problem? We are gonna hear a new poem, or at least a poem. Yes, it's gonna be in Swedish. Yes. I'm gonna read an excerpt from my book called Do you understand Woodstock? I missed Woodstock. It's a biography in, in poetry, and I'm going to start with a section where I'm a teenager living in a derelict building in the central Stockholm. I just met a beautiful girl. Hon såg ut som Joan Baez, och hon inviger mig i den vita sten som både visa och dårar kallar sin egen. Hon ger mig prerodin som jag knaprar hemma hos mamma en dag när hon inte är hemma. Lodaren med sin överdimensionerade överrock bjuder på första silen i en trappuppgång någonstans i gamla Klara. Virvelvinden som tar mig blåser mitt öde genom många år av besatt jakt på den ultimata kicken och besök på epidemisjukhuset i Roslagstörl. Himlen sänker sig över Särgels torg och Stockholmsterrassen är närmast. Där sitter vi många sena nätter med våra pipor och långa samtal. Resan börjar utan mål. Uh, I think we should talk a bit about cultural heritage. Uh, and I got to reflection to start with. Uh, before the writers arrived to Tranos, I interviewed them and asked about how, what book they thought was the best. Uh, the Swedes both answered that uh, it hasn't been written yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Irish and Welsh, though, uh, started to investigate books uh, they read and I assume are a part of a cultural heritage. Um, do you think there are, is a cultural difference in how we handle our cultural heritage in um, Ireland, Welsh, and in Sweden? It's a difficult question to answer, I think, because I'm a Swede and uh, the reason why I answered the way I did was because if the best book was written, why the fuck should the other be writing? <laughs> <laughs> so, having said that, there are a lot of beautiful books, and a lot of books I really love. T.S. Eliot, Dylan Thomas, William Blake. I mean, there are billions of books that I really like. But to pick the best one would really be, if you pick one, you, you, you're not fair to the other ones. So, and, yeah. Just take that question, what is the best book? Because if you're someone that, try, that reads a lot, you just think, I don't know, I generally don't know, there's just so many. I mean, I wish I could <coughs> have time to read half the things on my bookshelf, but they're starting to like grow off the floor now, I'm like, oh, I'll read it later. But um, out of all the things I've read, I can, if I'm put on the spot, I can maybe think of three, but then I'm always reading things that, that I think then, okay, that's going to go on my list of favourites, I'm definitely going to read that again or someone will recommend something, or someone will rave about something I absolutely detested. So I don't think there really is an answer for that one. And uh, when we responded, but we did not have a uh, correspondence to each other. We don't no. know who is uh, saying what. 
But maybe we didn't even have the same reason why we said yeah, the way we did. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the ground is a, it's a publishing or media strategy to find the best book, best ten books, top ten books, this and this. It's a publishing and media strategy. But in the sense of feeling, uh, it's impossible to say that, or to mention a best book. It's impossible. I cannot imagine to find the best book. Today you are uh, you like this book most. Tomorrow you may not like it. And there are ten people. Ten, ten people may have ten choices. So reading and writing is a totally individual choice. If you had asked what book has influenced me the most, or what author has influenced me the most, that would have been easier. Because then it would have been uh, Dylan Thomas, T. S. Eliot, etc. Still, but there is also it is not also static. Today you are you are thinking that he's based and you are influenced by him. After five years, you, it can be changed. No, so but someone new can I don't come. know if someone starts That's you out on something, yeah. and I don't think you're ever going to say, "Oh, actually, I don't like that person anymore mm -hmm. at all." It's mm -hmm. got no influence on. No, 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 it's not like it built you up to develop to develop you. You'd have reached that point because of that influence. It's it's, it's like um, the flowing river, and the, the flow will come and go. But, but that, it does not that, mean that you will forget the first flow. There are authors that are, that are, that are always going to be with me. I mean, the ones I just mentioned. I mean, this tradition of Dylan Thomas is to me the most important one because he actually gave me my language. And the, I don't write like him anymore, but I, I have inherited his musicality of language. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Dylan Thomas has a kind of uh, hypnotism. If you read him uh, as a poet, as a reader, you will be hypnotized. He, he had this power. And uh, on the other hand, That's what I uh, am uh, uh, one, one poet does not uh, only learn from the or influenced by the great writers. They are also influenced by the very minor writers. Mm -hmm. From the minor writers, you get an influence that you should do the better than these things. Mm -hmm. You should not do this like this. It means that you are helped by them also. But then that person as well, that main writer that you like, will still have some sort of effect on you, or would have, you know, got, you know, ha still ha have the way the way your writing is shaped would still be down to them. Maybe if you're not writing like them anymore, like Ben said, he doesn't write like Dylan Thomas anymore. And it's 45 so years. There's some elements. It's 45 it's, years ago I started yeah. to write like him. I don't do anymore, but it's, I still have his. I don't know, something of him is still in my writing, I, I, I know that. But, yeah. No. Uh, it's, 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 uh, finally, it's an individual. Uh, of course it is. And also, to read is a kind of experience. And uh, you know how to use your experience and where and why. But it's not only experience, it's also uh, knowledge about how to handle words, rhymes, alliterations, how to compose, how to, to, to make a piece that you're really satisfied with. It's developing yourself. It's poetic skills, yeah. yeah. Skills. It's, kind of, it's a craftsmanship also. It's writing is not only just to put together, and it's also craftsmanship. Uh, if one reads the, both the great writers and the classic writers and also the minor, then you will get the craftsmanship. And it's a kind of, and then you, you can develop your habit, the how we can, and you can have the, also the mastery in using the words. I think that's the problem with today with a lot of uh, young writers because they, they, they don't consider the tools that actually exist in writing poetry. I mean, there are a lot of, of things that you, you can use if you know about them, like alliteration in rhymes, word rhymes, etc., etc. There are a lot of, of things that uh, if you if you learn the formal poetry like sonnets and uh, Villanova and the rondel, rondos, etc., you, you get these tools with you. I, I used to, to write in all these uh, formats when I was younger, and, and, and the, the musicality of those formats also has uh, followed me through the years. And there is also, an, uh, the, uh, the, this is a kind of observation that, that how cultural the world is functioning today, and, uh, and how media is functioning today. As a, for a new poet, a new generation poet in Sweden, the what we have before them, poetry slam, but no uh, functioning. No, popular poetry is the only um, best poetry magazine. 
and I live in Sweden, I can tell it. But no newspaper in Sweden producing poetry or doing something for it. Then, and also the academic world is in another world. Then they have only poetry stuff and there is no discussion with poetry and no platform. That's the problem. That if you can offer platform, then they will be familiar. But uh, you need to present the things and you need to make them familiar with the things, then they can choose. That's why I told in the beginning one can do many things, but at one stage they will get their roadmap. Is that different in Ireland? Um, I think there are probably a lot more opportunities, would you mm -hmm. say, to discuss work. There's book clubs, are, you'll usually find one somewhere going on in Swansea. Um, open mic, um, there's workshops. I think it's much more embraced in Wales, especially with this year of Dylan Thomas centenary. You can't go anywhere without seeing mm. Dylan Thomas face on a bus or a council van. Or, um, but no, I do, I do think it's much. People are much more open to it. Still not entirely, but it's definitely getting more popular. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you think we have a Dylan Thomas in Sweden that could uh, open people's mind and we can have festivals and stuff? A writer, uh, a poet. Um, I was going to if they could. No, oh, I, 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 from next. I, I don't understand. It. Um, do you think we have a Swedish writer that could do, do the same thing as Dylan Thomas? Say we influence like Dylan Thomas. <coughs> who can say? I don't know. <coughs> we have trance drummer who is uh, of the same caliber, I guess, and we have a few poets back which, which are really good. Uh, but we don't have anyone with the same international impact because Swedish language is such a small language. Uh, is it, Trans Turner is a, an international poet and uh, he is read in more than 60 languages and that's definitely international poet. And next to Trans Turner there is Euron Sonneby. He's also um, quite international. But problem is, uh, I mean what you want to to ask that is the spirit of uh, Dylan Thomas in the, in the um, making the time. There is, uh, the time is missing, it's not only Sweden. The, the whole world is missing uh, Dylan Thomas. It's a different kind of spirit. There is, um, uh, there is no uh, the Dylan, Dylan Thomas spirit uh, in the poets today, no. But in our country there was one, but uh, uh, he's still alive. He was in the Gothenburg book fair, Nimrod and the Gold. The, the oldest poet. He had a kind of uh, Dylan Thomas spirit, but he's not that international. In the, if we compare him in the context of Bangladesh and in the context of Wales, then he is the Dylan Thomas in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. but not international. And then we are going to hear uh, an assistant read by Dominic. Okay, this is. Uh Anish's poem, um, and I'm reading it because it's written in, in the English language. It was uh, written in Bengali, translated it, Yes, it was written in Bengali and translated into English. And it was written very recently, on the 5th of July, 2014, mm. titled The First Night in Tronos. Dear poet, do you know it is not ideal for you to push aside the dreams, but to welcome them, to pass nights without sleep and dream means to abolish the line between a day and a night. Border between dark and light. If you do, what is the spirit of a day and night? Why do you dismiss the spirit of the play, look and hide between the earth and the sun? You can have pride that you bit the night in drinks, chats and counting stars in the sky. When the night is over and the day approaches, why do you hesitate to welcome the day? Why do you lose the power of your eyes and why the wings of your imagination so tired to say hello to the dews and listen to the music of birds? I hear the birds, the dews and grasses gossip about you. Anyway, I know well, you the poet don't care, that we all do. The king may not listen to you. The queen may have look on any of your beautiful verses that can open her mind. The world can be in your hands. I am surprised at your power to ignore all of these at one night. I can imagine the magic might have been in the eyes of the Queen, if one could have read those eyes. I know the fear from the King, gestures from the Queen, made you the sleepless King of the night.
at last I want to thank you for particip participating in this interview and uh, I want to wish you a great time in Charles. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say it. Cut! <laughs>